For 78 days between November 23, 2009 and February 9, 2010, Nigeria had an unavailable president and an available but powerless vice president. The last time the country had seen her president alive was on November 23, 2009, when President Umaru Musa Yaradua traveled to Saudi Arabia to receive treatment for a fatal heart condition known as pericarditis. For the next five months and a half, the condition of the president's health was shrouded in secrecy, and since power was not handed over to the vice president, good luck Jonathan, the country was somewhat at a standstill. This was until February 9, 2010, when after a vote by the National Assembly, Jonathan assumed the position of acting president. Unfortunately, when Yaradua did return from his trip on February 24, 2010, he was allegedly on a life support machine and died on May 5, 2010 in Asu Rock. He was 58 years old. Described as calm, humble, and incorruptible, Umar Musa Yaradua was the first governor of a state and the first president of Nigeria to publicly declare his assets, stating that he had nothing to hide. Yaradua, who was the first graduate Nigeria had as a president, upheld the rule of law and was impartial in his decisions when implementing court judgments. An example of this was seen when he restored Peter Obi as governor of Anambra State in 2007, following a court judgment. Obi had previously been impeached by the State House of Assembly due to corruption charges. Yaradua articulated his goals for the country through his seven points agenda, which included a focus on critical infrastructure, food security, human capital development, land tenure reform, national security and intelligence, the Niger Delta, and wealth creation. Although only the amnesty program for Niger Delta militants was quite successful, his efforts to actualize his vision for the country cannot be undermined. His death brought an end to a promising rule, but his legacy of transparency, electoral reforms, and the Niger Delta amnesty would never be forgotten. Umaru Musa Yaradua, the son of a former Minister of Lagos Affairs in the First Republic, Musa Yaradua was born on August 16, 1951, in Katsina, present-day Katsina State. His primary education began at Rafuka Primary School in 1958 and ended at Dotsima Boarding Primary School in 1962. He then attended Government College, Kefi, from 1965 to 1969, before proceeding to Barewa College, where he obtained his higher school certificate in 1971. Yaradua got his bachelor's degree in chemistry education from Amadu Bello University, Zaria, in 1975, and also a master's degree in analytical chemistry in 1978 from the same university. He started his working career at Holy Child College, Lagos, from 1975 to 1976 before serving as a lecturer at the College of Arts, Science and Technology, Zaria, between 1976 and 1979. Yaradua left the teaching profession in 1983 and became the general manager at Sabo Farms Limited in Funtua, Katsina State. Whilst there, he was a board member of the Katsina State Farmers Supply Company and was also a member of the governing council of both Katsina Polytechnic and Katsina College of Arts, Science and Technology. Umaru Musa Yaradua also served as the board chairman of the Katsina State Investment and Property Development Company between 1994 and 1996.
Yaradua's political journey began during Nigeria's Second Republic when he joined the Leftist People's Redemption Party, PRP. He was also one of the foundation members of the People's Front of Nigeria, PFN, a political association which had his elder brother, the retired Major General Shehu Musa Yaradua, as the leader. The PFN was formed during the transition program to restore the country to civilian rule and birth the Third Republic instituted by General Ibrahim Babangida. It later transformed into the Social Democratic Party and Yara Dua became the party's state secretary in Katsina. He contested on the party's platform during the 1991 governorship election but lost to the National Republican Convention candidate Saidu Bada. Seven years down the line, Yaradua was part of the founding members of the K-34, a political association formed at the inception of General Abdus Salam Abubakar's administration in 1998, which later evolved into the People's Democratic Party, and on this new platform, he once again contested for the governorship position in Katsina State and won. Umaru Musa Yaradua resonates in history as the first governor to publicly declare his assets. He was seen as an incorruptible governor who, in line with the promise he made when campaigning, ran an effective public administration, overseeing and ensuring that various developmental projects were carried out accordingly, and he made education a priority for his people by building several schools in local areas. Yaradua was re-elected for his second term in 2003. Reflecting on Yaradua's legacies that laid the foundation for the growth of Katsina State, his former commissioner and secretary to the state government, Mustafa Inua, said his late boss was a firm believer in financial discipline and did his work diligently. He stated that when Yaradua assumed office as the governor of Katsina State, the state treasury had just 10 million naira with a debt of over 550 million naira. But against all odds, he embarked on and completed so many projects in the state. He was able to repay the state's debt and even accumulated a surplus of $50 million. Yara Dua was among the very few governors in Nigeria who were not handed corruption charges by the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, EFCC. The seventh leader is here was a slogan that Yaradua's campaign group employed to woo Nigerians into believing that a leader who was ready to serve the country and her people had arrived. Indeed, the phrase aptly projected Yaradua as a Nigerian politician who was neither proud nor authoritative but had the good of the country at heart. Also, Many Nigerians thought that they deserved a break from the somewhat authoritative rule that had been experienced since the country gained its independence. Even Olusegun Obasanjo's presidency was seen as a dictatorship, as he was once a soldier and ruled as a military head of state. However, Yaradua's emergence as the flag bearer for the People's Democratic Party for the 2007 presidential elections was not a smooth one as the people saw him as an imposition by Obasanjo. Despite their inhibitions, Yaradua, who was 55 years old at the time, clinched the ticket after beating 11 other contestants by getting 3,024 votes from the 4,000 delegates who voted. Obasanjo congratulated him, calling him a worthy successor, and the journey to the presidency began. The governor of Bayelsa State, Goodluck Jonathan, was picked as his running mate, and this was seen as a move to placate the Niger Delta as militant, where at the time, attacking all facilities.
The 2007 presidential election was quite significant in Nigeria's history, as it would be the first time a civilian government would hand over to another civilian government. So, every antenna, so to speak, was tuned in and logged on to see the outcome of the elections and what would happen thereafter. The election was a litmus test to determine if Nigeria's democratic government would stand or collapse. President Olusegun Obasanjo was the first to hit the polity by declaring the elections as a do-or-die affair. The Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, also did not help the situation as there were so many irregularities. First, the voters' registration exercise was done shoddily and many people were unable to register so could not vote. Second, the electoral body did not display the voters' register as required by the electoral law, which led to numerous litigations against the commission. Finally, INEC refused to include the names of some candidates for the election. All these and more deemed the possibility of an election holding at all. Inter-party clashes were not left out as candidates jostled to come out as the flag bearer of their parties and it was a messy affair all around. Irrespective of all the happenings, the governorship and presidential elections were duly slated for April 14 and 21 respectively. During the governorship elections, there was a heavy security presence in some polling stations, but this did not prevent electoral violence. Ballot boxes were snatched, electoral materials arrived late, voters were intimidated, election results were rigged, and some people were not even allowed to vote. Human Rights Watch described the elections as marred due to late commencement and voting, non-availability of voting materials, massive disenfranchisement of potential voters and intimidation, rigging and violence. INEC had to rerun elections in some places that were affected by such irregularities. Due to the imperfections of the governorship elections, 18 leaders of political parties, including Atiku Abubakar and Muhammadu Buhari, clamored for the cancellation of the governorship elections, postponement of the presidential elections, and disbandment of INEC as an electoral body. All their efforts were in vain as the elections still held and means tensions in the country. The same scenario played out during the presidential elections and there was a low turnout of voters. The election result was announced on April 23rd and the PDP won, with Umaru Musa Yaradua polling about 70% of all the votes. Understandably, this victory was not acceptable to the leaders of opposition parties and their platform. The Conference of Nigerian Political Parties, CNPP, rejected the result and called for an interim national government of unity to be constituted Otherwise, they would cause civil unrest on the handover date. Amidst all the threats and fears, Obasanjo successfully handed over to the new president, Umaro Musa Yaradua, on May 29, 2007. President Umaru Musa Yaradua acknowledged that the election that brought him into power was majorly flawed and promised to work on electoral reforms. The president went ahead to inaugurate the Justice Ways panel on electoral reform made up by the best minds to come up with legal and administrative changes in the electoral space. President Yaradua also proposed a government of national unity in a bid to pacify the opposition and by late July of the same year, two opposition parties, the Progressive People's Alliance and the All Nigeria People's Party, agreed to join his government. Two members of the ANPP were later chosen to be part of Yaradua's cabinet. As soon as he became president, Yaradua got to work. He started by declaring his assets publicly on June 28, 2007, making him the first president to do so. Although the declaration of assets is mandatory for all public officers, it doesn't need to be declared openly, 
But Yaradua set the trend for the public declaration of assets, stating that he had nothing to hide. The vice president, Goodluck Jonathan, also declared his assets, but later claimed that he was forced to do so by Yaradua. He argued that declaring his assets would not reduce corruption or stop terrorism in the country. Yaradua stated that he declared his assets publicly to set an example for other politicians to shun corruption. In August 2007, Yaradua's administration launched the Seven Point Agenda. The agenda encompassed 1. Critical Infrastructure Declaring a state of emergency in the power sector, facilitating industrialization and movement through the improvement and development of railways, road and air transportation. 2. The Niger Delta, rolling out amnesty programs to empower the people of the region. 3. Food security, enhancing agricultural and water resources to ensure adequate food supply for local consumption and export. 4. Human capacity development, reforming the educational sector. 5. Land tenure reforms and home ownership. Reviving land use laws and providing affordable housing. 6. National security and intelligence. Protection of lives and properties. And 7. Wealth creation. Diversification of the country's revenue base. Yaradua's administration had the hope that with the seven point agenda, almost all of the country's developmental problems would be solved and Nigeria would become one of the 20 best developed economies in the world by the year 2020. In line with his promise during his inauguration, Yaradua formed a presidential electoral reform to look into legal factors and security issues that affect the quality and credibility of elections in the nation and suggest recommendations on the way forward. In June 2007, President Yaradua carried out a downward reverse of a hike in fuel prices from 70 naira to 65 naira. This was an action that was widely applauded by Nigerians. He also reversed the sale of Nigeria's refineries to private investors, calling the sale a rip-off. Yaradua's legacies include initiating the Niger Delta Amnesty Program to empower the Niger Delta youths. Most of them had become militants and were blowing up all facilities in the Niger Delta region in protest of the backwardness and non-development of their region by the oil companies. So, instead of clamping down on the rest of youths and using force, Yaradua chose to rehabilitate them. He believed that the continued deployment of soldiers and use of force would be ineffective in meeting the needs of the aggrieved youths. The NDAP commenced on August 6, 2009 and was a comprehensive system of dialogue, rehabilitation and development. The militants were encouraged to surrender their weapons, were reintegrated into society and were provided with appropriate social skills. This had a positive impact as the region once again enjoyed peace and oil production resumed fully. Another legacy was the inauguration of the Presidential Committee on National Minimum Wage, which was headed by the former Chief Justice of Nigeria, Salihu Belgo, to recommend a minimum wage of 18000 for civil servants. The Senate later approved the new wage on February 22, 2011, after it had been approved by his successor, President Goodluck Jonathan. He also recommended the dredging of the River Niger but could not follow through with the project. Likewise, the Abuja Kaduna Rail Route was Yaradua's brainchild, but he did not live long enough to see its completion, which was commissioned by President Muhammadu Buhari in July 2016. Also worthy of note was the release of federal allocations to Lagos State, which had been previously withheld by his predecessor, President Olusegu Obasanjo. Obasanjo had withheld the funds for four years because the then governor of Lagos State, Bola Tinobu, had created 37 local council development authority against his approval.
While still campaigning for presidency, Yaradua's failing health was visible to all as he struggled to speak and looked weak. But former President Olusegun Obasanjo said Yaradua was medically fit to lead the nation. Yaradua's health was a source of attack from opposition parties who said he was too frail to govern Nigeria. Despite all odds, he emerged victorious, but his health failed him and he died after just about three years in office. In his book, My Watch, Obasanjo accused Yaradua of deceiving Nigerians by keeping details of his illness secret and leaving the nation hanging. The Yaradua presidency remains a yardstick for other administrations in terms of transparency and upholding the rule of law. The late president was known for always putting the national interest of Nigerians above partisan consideration and promoting the notion that the law of the country was supreme and no one was above it. Although his administration had some flaws, like the hounding of Nuhu Ribadu, who was a chairman of the EFCC and the appointment of Farida Waziri as his replacement, which was frowned upon both at home and abroad. Also, the secrecy surrounding his illness, especially his last days at Aso Rock, and the refusal by some faceless members of a cabal at the Aso Villa to swear in Gulag Jonathan as acting president while his principal was receiving treatment in Saudi Arabia, remain a dent on the Yaradua's presidency. This confusion would last for more than 70 days until the National Assembly stepped in and confirmed Jonathan as acting president, on February 9, 2010. You can check out the full story in our next episode.